Welcome to the Holding Time podcast. Here we discuss breastfeeding in all its complexity, the ups and downs, the challenges and the triumphs. Whether you are expectant, a new mother, or simply interested, I hope you'll appreciate the incredible warrior women featured in this series. In this mini-series, we go back to feature some mothers who helped to shape the Holding Time project in Coventry. These interviews took place over Zoom in 2020, quite often under lockdown. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Find out more by visiting holdingtime.org or support us on our Patreon channel, Holding Time. How was breastfeeding with your first child? How was it for you in the very beginning? I mean, I think initially I was just really amazed that he did it. Like, I don't know, just sort of always have this nagging doubt in the back of your head, like, what if for whatever reason it doesn't work out? And I think, yeah, so initially I was like, oh, this is great. And they were like, oh, it'll hurt a little bit. So I didn't really worry that it hurt. I was ended up being in hospital for about three days. Oh. And kind of each time someone was saying, oh, how's the feeding going? And I'd say, it's really painful. Like, this doesn't feel right. It's really, really painful. Like, oh, but you've not fed before. You know, you're not used to this. It's meant to hurt. It's really going to hurt because it's, it's the first time. And they were like, oh, what kind of pain is it? I was like, I don't know what kind of pain. I, I've never experienced this before. Like, I can't tell you if it's like a deep pain or a nipple pain. Anyway, just knew it was, it was not good. Um and then basically kept being told, oh, it looks like he's latching really well. Uh, or or even worse, I can't really see, but I think it's a good latch. So then I'm like, well, if you, you're saying it's a good latch and everyone's looking at him saying, well, he's not got children to try and everything, everything's perfectly fine. And it, it just really wasn't. And it took it took about a week. A midwife came and told me on day five or something like that, or day, maybe even day seven, I can't quite remember. And she just said, oh, you're like wincing. You're not able to talk to me while you're feeding. Like, what's going on? Is everything okay? And I just thought, said, oh, it's really sore, but I keep being told this is normal. And she put me in touch with the infant feeding tool in Coventry, who were really great. Like, they just came and sat with me and helped me figure out how to latch in a bit better. And basically said, yeah, he does have a bit of a tongue tie and he's struggling to stay latched on deep enough and gave me some techniques and kind of... It, it, it improved, but it wasn't perfect. But probably by the time he was about six weeks old, I was like, okay, okay, yeah, this is, we've got this now. We're definitely fine. Well, he just self weaned when I was pregnant with my next. So he was about 18, 17, 18 months. And I'm a bit sad. I didn't want to stop, but equally, like, that was his choice. So it was a bit sad because he went from like being perfectly content on the boot to like the next fee, just literally screamed and refused it and then never had it again. Like, never wanted it again after that. Um, Amazing. Which is really, like, really bizarre. To Could be your milk yeah. change because you were pregnant. Yeah, so it, it definitely has because you have some weird food that week. So uh, it was my milk bit changed prior to that. I come out of it feeling like, actually, you know, that first bit was hard, but now I know how it's meant to be. That should massively improve things for next time. But I think it was just a lot of, like, a lot of self-doubt, and I think it was probably the same in my labour. Like, I had a test with labour with him, but actually, like, it didn't feel very good at all. And I think similar with the breastfeeding, really, again, like, even once it was going fine, I didn't really, still didn't fully know what I'd do until after. I've been like, oh, we've done this for ages. Like, of course I know what I'm doing. Yeah, so that was my first. With number two, he had a really noticeable tongue tie. Like, me and my husband saw it straight away. And the mid- even the midwife who was like, I'm not trained in this, but I can see that he's got that. And it was painful. But I think because I'd fed a baby before, they were like, when I said it hurt, they were like, okay, well, let's do, you yeah, know, let's do, see what we can do. And on day five or day six, I think we paid someone to sniff it for the thicker and for it because it was getting worse and the referral for and I think to do it on the NHS was going to be free out in the ages. And it definitely improved after that. But I think I'd had a lot more like damage whilst he was latching badly. So it took a lot, a lot longer for it to feel better. But I think I was just quite disconnected from the feet. So whilst it, basically what I remember of feeding him in the early days is it hurt and I didn't enjoy it because it had taken me away from my older son. And probably also it was just reminding me of how labour had gone and it was difficult and didn't feel like a particularly pleasant experience until probably when he was about six months old, I started to actually properly enjoy the time that I was feeding him, which was nice and not. I was like able to be there in the moment with him rather than kind of disassociated from what was happening. 
which was oh. great. But it was, yeah. I think, again, at the time, I didn't I really realise. It was one of those, like, you know, all the health and some midwives and things. How are you feeling? And you think, oh, yeah, I'm okay at the minute. But actually, like, I don't think I was, but I don't think I really realised at the time that I wasn't okay. Which I think is why it ended up actually being, like, a bit of a shock. Like, when he was born and actually to be not exactly the labour I'd planned because it was really fast and, you know, just, it, but it was actually amazing. It was better than I'd planned. His feeding was, was definitely painful and it was painful for a lot longer than it was with the other two. And again, he, he had a pain tie and we paid again for each other it slipped quite early on, but actually, like, it was more that he couldn't, just couldn't get the hang of opening his mouth really properly at all. So it took a long time. But I felt so much better about it. And I think because I felt better about it, I could, like, focus on how he was feeding each feed and, like, try and correct it. Um, yeah, I think I'm pretty happy still, which is nice. So there was quite a big difference then between your first, your second and your third, and your second sounds by far to be the most difficult mm, time yeah. you had, even though the actual feeding wasn't as bad as the third. Once he'd had a tongue tie snipped, the mechanics of it with my second were a lot easier than with either of the other two but particularly more so than with Icarus but actually a lot a lot more painful um but I think yeah I guess I think I've had a, a label where I'd initially thought I could trust what was you know trust the process and trust my body and then kind of be like I think now I've sort of gaslighted a bit to feel like I couldn't and I think that probably fed into the feeding side of it like it's hard if you can't trust what your like biology is capable of then actually how do you do a biological function let alone the emotions that go with it and all of that side of things so yeah three different very different journeys really and have you got three boys yeah three boys yeah yeah finnick harvey and Igris. oh how nice gorgeous were you breastfed yes i was breastfed my mum had no support when she fed us really so she we lived in west africa and it was one of those things like if she lived within an, like an African community, then there would have been lots of support. And it's not, I don't mean that they were completely separate, but it was just a bit of a strange situation where they were quite certainly isolated from family because all of our family were in England. And yeah, so I think actually my mum struggled a lot, struggled to feed my brother and that would be really painful. But then I don't think she fully understood what the difference would be, why it wasn't painful by the time she had me, for example. I didn't, so I didn't really like talk to her much about it. And they're not, they don't get very close by anyway. But my husband's been really supportive, actually. Like he, particularly with my second, where I was really struggling every feed, like in the night, pretty much. I'd wake him up for every feed and he'd just sit and like, just eat like things like gently stroking my head because then I'd have something like positive to think about. And yeah, a lot of like, he's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think he's probably like the biggest champion for me in terms of actually, but I don't think I could have kept going many of them really like without him which is really wonderful and I've got a couple of friends who oh, have breastfed sometimes it was just a case of knowing that somebody else was also saying it wasn't straightforward or like you know people all get given different advice so like hmm, this advice didn't work for me but you could have it just to, you know just try this just in case and that was really incredible I had a part of an elite group with my there that we've all kept in touch throughout you know even four years later now and I found that a lot of them to be very supportive, which is really, really great. Even like via WhatsApp in lockdown and stuff, which has been really good as well. Yeah, that model of creating a small network for NCT is, I think it's a really good one. Yeah. You know, it's a shame it's paid, like that it's not just, why can't the government just do something like that? I suppose it'd be complicated no. for them to do, you know, they need a small organisation to do it. But it'd be nice if there was a facility where you could ask about and you could get it for free because it does seem to really work the main reason we did it like we didn't really feel that much that we needed to learn lots about it because we'd had quite a few like nieces that had been born so we spent a lot of time with them so we kind of felt like we understood a fair bit probably not everything but i don't think even the mct course prepared us for everything but definitely we joined it because we were like oh okay then there's eight people who i know are having babies at the same time who you know even if we don't all get on, that's quite a lot of, I say eight people, eight couples. So like, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a good, a good thing. It would be amazing if that was available. It is really sad. It's like with doulas and things as well, actually. Like it's really sad that it has to be 
something that you, you have to, it's quite a privilege to afford it. And the tongue tie. <laughs> and the tongue tie thing, yeah. Yeah, it was a she was like, wait, I think, from the point of being referred. And I think I've heard people having to wait a lot longer, but I don't think I'd have kept, certainly with Harvey, I wouldn't have kept feeding him for another two weeks. Yeah, it just was so, so sad. I don't think I could, he could have kept going. So, I, I mean, I hate to yeah. tell you, but there is no tongue tie service in Coventry now. No, it shouldn't. You have to go to Warwick, don't you, to, I think, or not even COVID. Now. It's all been Oh, cut. wow. The fact is that women's services just get cut. And people yeah. think it's okay and it's really not. You know, what that means is that if someone doesn't have 30, 50, 100 quid to go to an independent specialist, their child won't be breastfed if they're tongue-tied. That is yeah. profoundly wrong, especially when you consider that that mother might be really willing and eager and desperate to breastfeed and the long-term health implications for that child. It's, it's, just, it's just wrong. You know, it's just yeah. it's so cheap. <laughs> I get really angry about things like that. Yeah, me too. It's not it's not right, is it? And it's, I just keep thinking if men had babies and if men breastfed, all this stuff, it might not all be free and it might not all be straightforward, but it, there would be a lot of people doing all of these different things like infant feeding support. There'd be a lot more of that. And just, I don't know, people would be investing a lot more money into it, I think, which is quite yeah. hard, very frustrating. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that... Um... You know, if you look at other momentous life events that happen and the amount of support that exists around them, like, for example, I mean, I know it's, it's different because it's a terminal illness, but if you look at, like, if you're diagnosed with cancer, the kind of support you get, the sort yeah. of treatment you get, you know, you think, well, this is about wellness. Yeah. The whole sort of thing about the health service has been tilted towards disease away from wellness. Mm. So all the resources gone to making people well that are ill rather than keeping people yeah. well that are well. You know, I think yeah. that's supposed to be changing. But even in the yeah. NHS long term plan, it was a struggle to get breastfeeding included. Can you believe that? Yeah. I mean, I mean it's so shocking. Thing, but it's rubbish. Yeah. How do you find breastfeeding in Coventry? Not had any negativity actually at all. Like I found people, I've had a couple of people like come up to me and say, "Oh, like that's amazing that you're just feeding." I've never made an, any attempt to cover up because it was, it was so hard of infants to get them to latch anyway. There's no way that I was going to like put a cloth over their head so I couldn't see what they were doing the whole time. And a couple of people called me and said, oh, I'm, I'm really glad that you've, like, felt comfortable enough to feed here. And so certainly, like, a couple of cafes that, that I quite like to go to where they're, like, really, I think, just they felt pleased that then, you know, people know that that's, like, a safe space to be. And, uh, yeah, I've not had any, like, funny looks or funny comments or anything like that, which I find really great because I definitely read a lot of stories from other people that are saying there's quite a negative reaction. I think I end up having a lot of, certainly this is like pre-COVID, I guess, when you're actually able to be out and about in the community with other people. But I definitely have had conversations with women that have made me feel quite sad just because, that you know, they'll women chatting. Oh, I, I just couldn't breastfeed, you know, I didn't make any milk or I, I had to trough up with formula. And I find it really hard because actually I don't think that's true a lot of the time. I think the number, of, I can't remember what the percentage is, but the percentage of women that don't make enough milk is really, 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 really low. It's just that people are given poor advice or no advice and formula is an easy option, except obviously I think people think that phrase said is best is important in terms of if rescue is not working out, it's really important your baby is fed. Absolutely. But actually like it, it diminishes how people feel about it. I think there's a lot of people that stop breastfeeding but don't want to. And so then you're just kind of saying, oh, but at least they're fed. And it, it diminishes that emotion of, okay, but I'm still hurting because something I wanted to do isn't working. But I think that's, yeah, I've definitely had a few conversations that that has, things like that have come up where, yeah, I think probably they were given poor advice or, or potentially were just too exhausted and that's understandable too, really. But it would just be nice if there was a bit more support. So if they made the choice to switch to formula, that that can be like a fully comfortable and informed choice and not an agonising, sad one that just happens when they're not ready. Well, I suppose, you know, some of it, you know, there's a lot in there, but some of it is that when people say they haven't got enough milk, a lot of that's to do with the cultural ignorance around breastfeeding because people don't realise you actually have to quite often create milk by cluster feeding. You know, yes. that when a baby's feeding a lot, that's because they're bringing down more milk. If people don't understand that, they will think, oh, the baby's really hungry and I haven't got enough milk. You know, it's, yes. it's, 
it's just a sort of real lack. We've lost the expertise, basically. And yeah. that is leading to less and less breastfeeding. It's a downward spiral. I mean, you can try and correct it by having peer to peer mentoring and peer support. But that's, that cannot compensate for having a friend or your mother or someone close to you that's there constantly, consistently gives, you know, guiding. Cause it's, it's not a, a one off relationship, is it? If you yeah. need support, you need support maybe weekly or every other day or maybe every day. Yeah. And it makes me, um, very sad and sorry, the whole thing. I suppose that's why I'm doing this work because to some degree we can change it. I mean, I think YouTube's a great tool for getting sort of new information circulating. Women, they really do watch these videos. It's surprising that this sort of technique isn't being used by everyone. It, as you said before, like there's a lot of NHS money goes to treating diseases and problems. And of course, labour and birth and breastfeeding aren't or shouldn't be problems. They're not illnesses unless you are unwell within that situation. But actually, that's a separate yeah, kind of it's not at all something that needs to be medicalised. And I, I'm kind of like quite opposed to it being med medicalised. But on the other hand, what I have seen is that when people do have problems, even in Coventry is quite a good service. Women are brought back into hospital and, and shown how to use a pump. Well, that's quite good. That's actually better than Brighton. But it's all just private sector, you know, having to fill in all the gaps. And yeah. yet this is quite an easy thing to provide. So I interviewed people at... The Royal Brompton, and they have a, a, a baby unit for children with heart problems. And those mothers are really encouraged to breastfeed. I mean, yeah, they have. They their babies are taken from the womb to an operation. You know, it's really, really tough. And nearly all those mothers, in the most extreme circumstances, nearly all of them are successful breastfeeders. And you think, okay, so we we do know how to support women through breastfeeding and through the most extreme situations, because in that situation, the health of the baby is at stake. The life of the baby is at stake. But yeah. actually, when you look at breastfeeding statistics generally, it's like it's the health and well-being of all children that's at stake and actually all mothers. Because there is this mental health impact of wanting to breastfeed, not being able to breastfeed. Like you say, the, the, the grief attached to it not going the way you want. And it has, a. I mean, I think personally from talking to a lot of women, it has this really long term effect. My mother-in-law, her eldest, had a tongue tie, but nobody knew about that as a thing back then. And so it's my husband's brother. And she really struggled to feed him. There was no support. And it was just a, well, if you can't feed him, you know, pop him on for me there. And so I'd be with she said, my husband, his younger brother, like she didn't try and understand that he's so, because actually it had been so traumatic and she's beating herself up so much mm. over it for not. Because, she, yeah, because she felt like she couldn't, like she'd failed, because she didn't want to try the next time. And you cannot, absolutely cannot blame her for that. But it's only really since she's then had grandchildren, and then, you know, all three of my children have had tongue tied for two short so Oh, okay, so if I'd have had support, actually, maybe it would have been possible, and it's not. And I think that's quite hard to suddenly think. It's a good thing that she's realised it's not her that failed, but also it's really rubbish to realise that actually she just needed someone to sit with her probably a few times a day for a few days right. to help her like figure out what to do rather than just be told oh, here's a bottle that's not the problem like, mm. right. yeah no it's it tends to be women who are networked into support systems that do better so it's either black and minority ethnic women who've got an unbroken culture of breastfeeding with aunts mm. and mothers and mother-in-laws who are all sort of helping them through and giving them advice and also just literally physically helping or it's it's mothers who can afford to pay for that support in one way or another and patch it together. Often yeah. I find that's still quite a difficult option. You can't really compensate for that cultural belonging to breastfeeding. Yeah. There's a great deal to be said for just having the mindset, like you said about birth, you know, of just trusting your body and believing that this will work. But then you will always have problems. Like you had that faith, but still the problems are there and you have to still get over them yeah it sounds like your husband was really the person who really sort of saw you through those dark days you know more than the professionals 
Oh yeah, definitely. And I think I guess because he, you know, certainly for that first couple of weeks, he's there all the time. And even after that, in the night, when it, it is always quite a lot harder in the night. I don't know whether it's just because I'm more tired or there's nothing else to focus on or what. But he would fit with me quite a lot and just. Yeah, certainly for a second, it got to the point where, because I've had the few sets of you getting up, Stephen Nappy, like changing Nappy, all of that stuff initially anyway, we got to a point where I could definitely have physically have done those things, but he was still kind of getting up in the night to like, just be with me really and kind of distract me or like encourage me. And I remember a few times it was one of those, it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle and it really hurts to latch your baby on. So then you're really tense, but then you can't latch your baby on properly. And he'd kind of be there to try and keep the baby calm. Like, so I'd basically be there trying really hard not to scream. And he'd just hold the baby, like, stroke his head, like, just stick the apartment. But with all of them, like, stroke the head and say, it's okay. So that at least, certainly in my mind, at least what the baby's feeling isn't my stress. From there, so it kind of relaxes the whole situation a lot more, which, yeah, he's been fantastic, really. I don't, I don't think I'd have kept going very easily. I don't think I'd have kept going at all, really, if he hadn't been supportive me. I really, really hear you. And and it's something that I'm super interested in. There's like a couple of things for me that have really come out of talking to women about breastfeeding over the years. And one of them is the importance of women like you that breastfeed for a long time and like the expertise that you start to develop as an experienced breastfeeder and how important, like how valuable that is culturally and how undervalued it is you know like that for me is one thing that's really interesting women who breastfeed full term women who breastfeed multiple children become these kind of mentors because these are not things that are talked about in relation to breastfeeding you know like everyone's always about support but they don't really talk about this and the other thing that's really really interesting to me is the role of partners and I have to say particularly it tends to be men. I mean, I suppose I don't speak to that many lesbian couples. You know, some of the women in my photos are lesbians. But, and perhaps it's not fair to say that, that it's just a male thing. But I do think that person who's there all night and mm. all day, the fact that your partner got out of bed at night, it's so much about that solidarity and that showing of support and just not letting you be on your own. I think... That is really massive. That role for fathers of of really educating themselves, being really knowledgeable, I think it's it's least a bit overlooked. Yeah. You could be think... training an army of peer to peer mentors. It would never be as effective as, as educating that one person that's right next to the mother. Yeah, absolutely. Well we've now that we've lost our like wise women in the village. We, yeah, you need the, I can say the person that's with you the whole time to be, the, to be there, really. Yeah, and it's kind of the, you know, the sort of changing face of what parenthood is, isn't it? I mean, our children don't play in groups in the street. You don't have a shared collective kind of overview of children. It is very much down to the nuclear family and the partner that's there, whether or not it's the biological father or whatever, that partner that's there, that person, and if you don't have that person, the interesting question is, how do you get through it? You know, who do you? Often I find it's mothers help out a lot in that situation. So you've had two children pre-COVID. How did that affect your experience this time? Was it positive or negative? You know, what did you notice? So I think a lot of the time it's very hard to kind of plan things. So it was hard to kind of know, you know, what was the... When I first got pregnant, I thought, oh, okay, well, by the time he's born, we'll be back to normal. And I think... Therefore, kind of assuming, well, I'll be at baby group, so I will be feeding alongside other mums, and all of those things will be back up and running. And of course, of course, they're not yet still. Well, some are, but they weren't when he was born in January. So I think that was quite a big, a big shift. And also, like I had contacted the infant feeding team uh, after he was born as well. But again, like, you know, previously, then I come and sat in my living room and just essentially wait until you've ready, really you know, they tried to time it where he might be hungry, but who knows, and they just sat and waited until you were ready for a feed. And actually what initially happened was someone tried to like they video told me. But they videoed called me kind of twenty minutes after he just finished the feed and he was fast asleep. Of course, that's yeah. They said, Okay, well what time do you think he'll feed again? And this is a just three or four day old baby. I just know what time he's gonna feed again and, and so then I had to go to the infant feeding clinic, which was better. Like, I'm not sure how how I'd have latched him on and held up the phone to, like, 
show what to, yeah what was going on anyway but even then it's just a lot harder because again you're suddenly like you're sat on a sofa that's not your own sofa and you've got like different cushions to what you'd have at home so actually how how do you then lap the baby on at home where it's actually very different and yeah I think it was quite a, a lot more challenging just accessing that service and I I love that that service is still running but I yeah it's not it was much less pop, like much less good experience with the team, not because of the team, but just because of how it's set up compared with when I spoke to them before. So that's definitely been a more of a challenge. And also I think, yeah, the I guess previously I would have been I love going to baby groups. I like being in cafes and chatting to people. I like socializing generally. So previously I would have taken been been out of the house within a week or two of giving birth in order to like just go and meet a few new people, not necessarily every day. And in that respect, like, I missed the connection with other new mums, particularly, like, just the chance to, like, just sit and not be, like, exercising in a push chair. But on the other hand, I've not previously then experienced any level of just being at home and just creating that, like, family bubble. And actually, that was quite a good experience. Like, you know, I'd had him at home and we'd... The midwives hadn't arrived in time, so actually it had just been me and James and Icarus. And then and wow. then my elder he was asleep in bed at the time. So so I actually kind of had that and then had quite a few days where it was just us or like my parents or us before bubble came. And I think previously that would have driven me crazy, but actually it was really good to have that bonding time and that I don't know, just lying in bed together and chilling out rather than having to be at a hospital or not at a travelling home or going out all the time to baby groups and stuff so I think there's been good and bad Thanks for listening and thanks to everyone involved our funders, the Infant Feeding Team and University Hospital Coventry and Warwick for their support along with all the amazing mothers and partners who helped to make this project happen You can learn more about the project by visiting holdingtime.org and support us on our Patreon channel There's a link in the description. Thanks for listening and be sure to like, follow or subscribe so you don't miss any of our content.